G'day guys, Dean from Blog for the Blood God here, and today I want to talk to you about the new Traitor Guard data sheet. But what I want to do is something slightly different than what you would have already seen online. There's tons of people out there reviewing it, comparing it to cultists, comparing it to a cursed cultist, comparing it to all the relative, you know, relatively similar units, and then making all these micro criticisms about which one's slightly better in this way, which one's slightly better in that way. What I want to do today is talk to you about the role that the unit fills and how to determine whether or not something is better at fulfilling a role. So this is going to be touching on the Trader Guard and the Cultist comparison, but it's going to be a more broad and general piece of advice for when you're constructing your lists, how to determine which units you want to include, because there are many other parallels, for example, Possessed and Chosen. They fill very similar battlefield roles, they have a very similar points cost, they take up the same battlefield role in that they're both elites. So how do you determine which one of these units you want to take? How do you determine if you want to take warp talons, raptors, or bikes? They all fill similar battlefield roles. So in this video, I want to talk to you about some of the methods that I use to determine which units I include in armies. So it's going to be a, a really uh, sort of almost philosophical conversation about the approach that I have when determining these things. Now, I'm not by any stretch of the you know word and a genius or anything like that when it comes to this shit. I just have a few principles that have served me well over my time in the Warhammer 40k tournament scene. So I wanna share those principles with you and hopefully they'll serve you well as well. So with that being said, let's just jump straight into the video. Walk for the blood god. G'day guys. So as I said in the intro, today is, we're going to be talking about um, the new Trader Guard, comparing them to cultists, and then going through some of my principles when determining which data sheet I want to use and which one's more suitable for the battlefield role that we're trying to fill. Um, so it's going to be a, hopefully a relatively deep uh, conversation, but hopefully one that's also practical and actionable. So. Uh, let's start by just sort of touching on this new Traitor Guard release. So it's very exciting, it's very cool, and hopefully it does lead to a Traitor Guard codex down the track, because I think Traitor Guard are a faction that's uh, very present in the narrative of 40k, so it'd be nice to see them represented on the tabletop. Um, but as for now, we've just got the couple of data sheets. We've got like the, the character guy with his Ogren bodyguard, and we've got the squad. Now, I just want to talk about the Traitor Guard squad at this point because uh, I think the character it's pretty obvious that you know he's kind of irrelevant all he really does is buff the squad and you're not bringing a character to buff your cultists um, and that's effectively what Trader Guard are so I don't think he's worth it he takes up an elite slot which is something that's a very high value in the CSM book so I just think he's pretty much e he's very easy to disregard him out of hand however the Trader Guard unit is not so easy to disregard because it's very similar to the cultists in a lot of ways so I guess the main differences to outline, and whenever you're comparing two units, whether it be Trader Guard and Cultists, or whether you're comparing like Possessed and Chosen, and, or Chosen and Terminators, or whatever it is, um, what you want to do is you want to um, find out what the key differences are. So realistically what it is, is it's going to cost you an additional 10 points to take the Trader Guard. And what you get is you get a 5 plus armor save instead of your 6 plus, you get a slight leadership buff, uh, but most importantly, you get access to three uh, special weapons. So you can take a bunch of plasmas and flamers and melters and all that shit. So um, that's the main differences. I'm sure there are more subtle differences in there, but they're the main ones that are going to be relevant for this conversation. Um, so now what I do when comparing these two is instead of what, what a lot of people online are doing is they're doing like... They're doing things where they're saying, well, for 10 points, you get three special weapons, and a special weapon on a squad of Marines would cost X number of points, so therefore it's good value, right? And that is logically coherent, but the problem is they're ignoring what the f actual role and responsibilities and scope of the cultists is. The cultists are not there to do damage. So being able to upgrade their weapons is kind of irrelevant, which I think is part of the reason why those upgrades are free, is because nobody would ever spend points to put melter guns on their chosen. 
that you just would never do it, you know? So making them free is a way of going, cool, now your unit has something that makes it interesting and it could be, you know, this, that or whatever, but it's not, you know, it's not the end of the world, it's not going to blow balance out of control, that sort of stuff, right? So my thought is you, you have to, when comparing these two units, you have to look at, well, what is the unit in your army for? What is its purpose? What is its goal? And what is its role? So for me, the cultists do a number of things. I think they're actually one of the most underrated units in the entire CSM codex because they're cheap, right? And that allows you to do things with them that you would otherwise need to dedicate an expensive unit to do. So for example, you can use them to raise banners, right? And if you're raising banners with them, that means your chosen, your possessed, your, you know, everything else can be advancing up the board to turn one. Instead of sitting on a backfield objective raising a banner, they're advancing forward and they're putting pressure on your opponent and they're, you know, engaging in combat. Like if your opponent goes first and they move forward, you can then just go, cool, well, my possessed are going to move forward. They're going to advance. Then I'm going to creations of Bile, Black Legion, Red Corsairs, whatever it is. You're going to use that to advance and charge. And now you're in combat turn one with those possessed instead of wasting your time with them raising a banner, all right? So I think I almost look at the cultists in that regard as an, a, a way to get um, additional actions completed and actions are things that almost always directly translate into victory points. So having those units that are able to do those actions for you while the rest of your army does all the heavy lifting is very powerful. So that's the first role of the cultists. Now, does having a better armor save or melty guns make them any better at doing that? No. So already you've got a points cost that I know, I know it's only 10 points, so it's very, very cheap, but still it's a 10 point upgrade that doesn't help them achieve their goal. Now, what are some of the other goals of cultists? Uh, screening out enemy deep strikes is another one, right? So if you want to move your army, Chaos Space Marines are a very combat heavy army. So you want to move them up, you want to be engaging in, in the middle of the board and trying to push into your opponent's deployment zone. You want to be pushing forward aggressively, right? Almost every legion that is true for. So that's the goal for the cultists, is to, uh, that's the goal for the CSM, is to be pushing forward. However, if you're going up against somebody like a Blood Angels or, you know, Gene Stealer Cult or Sisters of Battle with their Zephyrim or there's in in numerous armies that have the ability to do massive amounts of damage from a unit that arrived via Deep Strike that turn. So if you're going up against them, you don't want to leave holes behind your army where they can drop in their army, right? So this is another place where the cultists come in extremely valuable because you can leave that 50 point unit of cultists out of line of sight behind a ruin somewhere but because your cultists are in that back corner that means that your opponent can't drop their Zephyrum bomb in that back corner and then charge and blow up your backfield and split your army in half because if they drop in behind you you then have to turn around with something and go back to deal with that threat. So having the cultists able to screen out your backfield and prevent your opponent from dropping in behind you means that your opponent has to engage with your front lines and that's where your powerful units like your Chosen and your, your um, Possessed and your Terminators are. So that's another thing that cultists do that once again, spending extra points to give them a better armor save and better weapons doesn't really help, right? So, I mean, the armor save could theoretically help if there's no way that you can hide them and your opponent's able to allocate shooting into them, but it's very, very marginal. So I personally think that it's a pretty safe thing to say that having those, um, having those cultists hidden at a line of sight means that giving them better weapons and better armor and better leadership are all irrelevant. So, okay, so that's their second purpose. Their third purpose that I see them being really, really fucking good at is bubble wrapping. Now, what I mean by bubble wrapping is, say you're going up against a Blood Angels player and he's got a unit of Death Company, right? And you know that they can pregame move 12 inches, then in their first turn, they can move 12 inches, so they've moved 24 inches 
and then they can charge you. And they can, with various buffs, they can actually increase that distance by a couple of inches using chaplains or whatever, right? So you know that turn one, that unit of death company is going to be charging something. So let's say you've got a unit of 10 terminators and your plan is to put a whole bunch of psychic buffs on that 10 terminator unit so that it's really, really hard to kill. And then you're gonna throw that up the center of the table. You don't want your opponent to charge that 10 terminator unit before you get your buffs up, right? Because they're gonna kill it. If you, if you, you go, cool, I haven't put uh, mutated invigoration on them yet. I haven't put delightful agonies on them yet. You know, all of my command phase buffs, they haven't kicked in yet. If your opponent's able to charge it and hit it before you get all those buffs up, they're gonna fucking decimate it and it's really bad. So what you can do is you can bubble wrap it in cultists, right? Wrap them around so that your opponent can't actually get within engagement range of the Terminators, which means that that Death Company unit can't actually declare a charge on the Terminator units, which means it can't allocate attacks onto the Terminator unit, which means they can't damage it. So by having a 50-point unit of cultists, you've essentially provided your Terminator unit with the same utility as a transport, right? Because that's one of the main advantages of a transport, right? Is you can't target the units that are inside it. Well, you kind of, in a, in a roundabout way, achieve that with the cultists. So what I'll often do is I'll find a nice big ruin somewhere uh, and I'll put basically all the cultists run along the edge of the walls on the inside so they can't be seen by shooting. And then I put my Terminator unit behind the cultists. And it's like, cool, you can't shoot the cultists and you can't charge the Terminators. So what are you gonna do, right? And being able to do that just means that your Terminator unit get, is guaranteed to get all of its buffs off before your opponent engages with you. So that's a really powerful thing and that can only be realistically achieved by cultists. And once again, spending an extra 10 points on that cultist unit to give it better armor, better leadership and better guns isn't gonna help them achieve that, that goal. So realistically, they're, they're my three main purposes. I'm not saying that there aren't other things that cultists do and that cultists do well, but ultimately that's sort of what I see. The, I guess the fourth one is that they are objective secured bodies, right? So sometimes you'll have your cultists hidden behind a, a wall so that they're within six inches of an objective. And then you'll put like your, you know, your, your valuable units out onto that objective. And then in your next turn, you'll move your cultists out to put one cultist on that objective so that now you have an objective secured model on there, but you also have all your terminators on there, right? So now if your opponent wants to take it off you, they can't just put one objective secured model on that objective. They actually need to commit to killing a lot of stuff. So that's, I guess that's another use for them as well. So there's plenty of things that they do, but my, I guess my point I'm trying to make here is that none of those things are improved by having better armor or guns. So I actually think that this is, whilst it's a 10 point upgrade that's very valuable, it's undeniably of high value. It's one that is not needed and therefore it's kind of a trap. And if you have, say you've got three units of cultists, if you do this, that's actually 30 points which 30 points, that could be, you know, that's almost another Terminator, that could be, you know, more Chosen or Possessed, that could be, you know, that's almost half of a Rhino if you want to put your Chosen in a Rhino, you know, and then that that's a huge difference. So I would be, personally, I would be spending those points elsewhere, and the only time I would do this is if I wrote a list and I was really happy with everything in the list, but I had like 10 points to spare, and there was no upgrades that I could put on anything else. And I was just like, you know what, fuck it. I don't have anything else to upgrade and I'll make one unit of my chose, my cultists or two units of my cultists or whatever. I'll bump them up and I view it almost as an upgrade to a cultist unit, not as a separate data sheet. Um, so basically that's, that's, that's my thoughts on the Trader Guard. Now I'll just do a quick, quick uh, go through of some other examples so that you get a bit of an idea of what I mean when I'm talking about my principles when it comes to determining which units are better. So let's take Terminators and Chosen, right? Because they're very similar data sheets, right? They have three wounds, they're toughness four, they have accursed weapons. You know, the main differences are that the Terminators get the, um, the combi bolters. The Terminators have a few different war gear upgrade options. The Terminators have a two-up save. 
uh, whereas the Chosen lack all of that, but instead the Chosen have uh, core and therefore acts uh, so they have uh, icons sorry they have icons which gives them you know access to a few different things that terminators don't they can you know get the plus one ap if they're corn or they can get plus one to hit if they're slanesh or you know if they're word bearers they can do act that word bearer specific action there's a few things that they can do with that icon keyword um so how do you determine do you want to take terminators or do you want to take chosen like what do you want and the way that you answer that question is, well, what is the unit there for, right? Identifying the purpose of the unit and then identifying which of the pros and cons for each of those units better aligns with that purpose. So if you go, okay, I'm taking this unit, I want it to be a big unit that's going to wrap around my characters, it's going to be there to keep my characters safe, it's going to be there as a bit of an anvil so that I can head down the table and I can be really strong and it's not going to die and it's going to, you know, it's going to be really hard for my opponent to kill and that's going to allow me to pressure the mid-board consistently throughout the game. That's the purpose of the unit. Well, if that's the purpose of the unit, it sounds to me like Terminators are your option. Whereas... If you go, uh, I want a sort of all comers unit that's you know not too heavy invested. I want it to be MSU, so this is a unit of five that's going to be able to go out and trade. I want trading pieces in my army that can go out and basically I want to be able to send this unit of five in and kill more than their points worth or more you know do more relevant damage to my opponent than when they kill me in return. So that's another uh, really important way to play the game is that trading card style where, you know, your opponent puts up a unit, you kill it off an objective, then they kill you off the objective, then you kill them back off the objective and you just trade back and forth. And in those games, you want to try to make sure that you, you're winning those trades, right? You're trading something small for their something big. That's the, the best way to win those trading games. So if that's the case, you might be like, well... I don't want a fucking, you know, 340 point unit of Terminators. That's that's a bad trade because if they throw a fucking 180 point unit of Zephyrum in and kill it, well, now I'm, you know, I'm down significantly in resources for no realistic gain on the tabletop. So if you're trying to build that MSU style, well, then you go, okay, well, now the Chosen are looking more preferable. You know? Um... So that's one of the ways that you do that, and then you and then you start looking into okay, well let's let's do chosen versus possessed. Which one is better, right? So you go okay, well the possessed have the higher strength, toughness, movement, and damage. So that they're all very valuable things. However, what the chosen have is really high AP. They have high accuracy, and they're cheaper, right? So you go okay, well let's let's and they can go in rhinos is the main massive advantage of the chosen that they can go inside of rhinos. So now you look at it and you're like, okay, well, what is your game plan? Are you running something where you want, you know, independent units that are able to punch above their weight that are strong enough to survive on their own and run around and do work, right? If that's your case, well, then you want possessed. Whereas if you want to have a more technical, nuanced game where you have rhinos and you're doing things with the rhinos piling in and, and tagging things and... You know, you're using rhinos to slingshot units around the table and you want those units to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Armor of Contempt so AP is of high value to you because maybe the rest of your army is really low AP so you're like, well, I need something that can deal with a unit of Terminators because, you know, Possessed, for example, when they go into a unit of Terminators, they're fucking garbage because the Terminators are going to get three up saves against every attack that the Possessed throw and it's just yuck. So... You know, or maybe your opponent has a lot of neg one, and maybe your meta that you're, you know, building for has a lot of neg one damage, you know, and if there's a lot of neg one damage, then, well, the possessed aren't necessarily that good because they come, you know, AP two with one damage, that's yuck, you know, whereas, especially for the points cost that you're investing in them, whereas if you take the chosen, well, you're like, well, now you're really high AP and you will one damage anyway, so the neg one damage doesn't come into play. So you've got to decide, well, well, what is the role of the unit? You know, am I doing some kind of vehicle-based rhino rush, technical, slingshotty kind of complex play? Or am I running something that's a little bit more um, self-sufficient, self-reliant? In which case you go, okay, well then, if that's the type of list that I'm building and that's the, the purpose of the unit's existence, well, then you want to do possessed, you know? 
So you can basically use this principle and use this process when making your list decisions. So the, the way you want to do lists, my advice is first pick the second areas that you want to play to, right? Look at, you've picked your faction, you know what faction you're running because you pick a faction that you like, right? That's, that's generally what people do. So you pick a faction that you like, you go, cool, I'm playing Chaos Space Marines. That's, that's the faction that I want to play. Then you go, okay, what secondaries do I like that are available to the Chaos Space Marines? And you look through all the secondaries available, you pick the ones that you like, and then you go, okay, now, what is my plan for achieving those secondaries? So, for example, if you pick, if you say you're running word bearers, right? Well, you want lots of units with icons to do the word bearers specific secondary. So, all of a sudden, you're like, okay, Terminators are cool and they're very strong, but they don't have icons and they are slow. They have limited movement, which means it's going to be hard for them to get up into the center of the table early and it's going to be hard for them to sort of consistently do the work. So maybe what you need to do is take a bunch of rhinos with a bunch of units of five chosen in them with icons in all of those units. And now you can just keep slingshotting a unit out of that rhino and launching it up into the center of the table so that it can do the action. And if you do that, it's like, well, now that aligns with your game plan. So your game plan of based on your secondaries informs what what uh, duties need to be performed. You know, what what are the things that need to happen for me to get these secondaries, and then what units can do those things and do those things well. And that's basically your list will build itself up from there. So comparing the uh, the roles of the units is the best way to do it. So whilst it is tempting, and it is still relevant, right? It's still relevant to take the points efficiency of units because sometimes writing a list that doesn't care for secondaries and it's just raw points efficiency is a viable strategy, right? This is something that Tyranid players do all the fucking time. Is they go, cool, I've got this crazy Leviathan list where everything is just ridiculously points efficient everything is so powerful and everything is so cheap and everything is so fucking tough and you're like i don't i'll figure out the secondaries later i'm just going to run a brutal list right that's a very viable strategy i don't think that that's a strategy that's particularly relevant for chaos space marines which is why with this new trader guard release i think that looking at the raw points efficiency isn't the way to go because i don't think you're creating a points efficient style you know, brute force Chaos Space Marine list. I think in order for Chaos Space Marine lists to be successful, they need to be nuanced, they need to be technical, and they need to um, they need to be built for purpose, you know? You can't just build a, a list that's just there to be a strong list. It needs to be like, okay, what does this list do? What does it do well? And how does it do it, right? That's, that's the best way to run Chaos Space Marines, in my opinion, but I could be wrong. So let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Let me know if you think I've, I'm on the money here or if you think I'm full of shit. Um, and let me know if you have a similar method that you use when uh, determining what units you include in your lists and, and how you go about writing your lists. Let me know. Let's have a conversation. I love the chats we have in the comments below. And uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers. Alrighty guys, thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed that video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Like, subscribe, share the fuck out of it. Do all that good shit. I love your work. Conversations that we have in the comments section keep me busy all day. So while I'm supposed to be at work doing my job, I'm busy reading and responding to your comments. So <laughs> it gets me in trouble sometimes, but I think it's worth it because 40K is something I'm passionate about. Engaging with the community is something that I'm passionate about and you guys provide me with that passion. So thank you very much for that. Thank you to my Patreons for keeping the lights on and keeping me motivated and inspired to generate as much of this content for you that I possibly can. So a huge thank you to those guys over on Patreon. If it's something that you've considered, please jump over and check it out. We've got a Discord up and running. We've got a whole bunch of shit. It's sick as fuck. We're a bunch of mad cunts and I love it there. We have great chats. Also, if you want to show your support for this video specifically, but don't want to go to, through the effort of signing up on Patreon or any of the other ways that you can support, hit that super thanks button. You can chuck us a dollar just to say fucking good job, cunt. We like the video. That's a real easy, simple way that you can show your support. And that also lets me know 
what content is really popular and what content you guys want to see more of. Because basically, if I get more super thanks on a video, I know, well, that video is popular, I should make more like that. Whereas if I get no super thanks, I'm going to be like, oh, well, people clearly didn't appreciate that video as much as the others, so I'll steer away from that kind of content. So super thanks is a really good way of giving me live, active feedback that I can then turn into action and sort of use that to generate better and more relevant content for you. So chuck us a super thanks, chuck us a Patreon, chuck us a like, a subscribe, a comment, all that good shit, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks again, guys. I love your work, and I'll see you around. Cheers. Walk for the blood god. Warhammer community suffers from some of the most prohibitively expensive essentials in the world, especially Australian content creators. Every single day, Dean wants to create content, but he can't. Suffering from old, worn-out brushes, expensive model kits, and costly software and equipment, he can't endure much longer. Just look at this dirty paint water. Would you drink this? Would you let your child? Even a small monthly donation can help provide Dean with clean paint water, basic tools for survival, and access to life-saving information and education. So please, follow the links in the description below and find out how you can sponsor a mad cunt like Dean today and end the suffering. Suffering that is cruel, unsustainable, and your fault. Do your objective markers ever get lost behind terrain or other models and become difficult to see? Do they ever get bumped and accidentally moved during a game? And do they ever spark arguments about distances? Well, not anymore. Introducing the blog for the blood god, not even remotely patented, neoprene objective markers. Made from the same material as astronaut suits, or maybe military equipment, or probably neither of those things, this 2mm thick neoprene synthetic rubber is tear resistant, water resistant, and is designed to last. But that's not all, the blog for the blood god, not even remotely patented neoprene objective markers come in a variety of different designs and styles to suit any faction represented in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. These objective markers are a perfect gift for yourself or a friend and are a perfect way to flex and show your opponent that not only are you a smarter, cooler and better 40k player than them, but you also have more disposable income than they do. For the low price of $25, you'll get not one, not two, but six neoprene objective markers perfectly designed for 9th edition Warhammer 40k. But wait, there's more. For a limited time only, People who sign up on Patreon to support Blog for the Blood God as a Skull Champion tier $5 per month member will gain access to a custom design service where I will design a unique logo to support their gaming club like the one I did to the left here for the Potato Farmers local gaming club here in Melbourne. Follow the links in the description of this video to pick up your set today.